Um, this is phonology session one, I believe. Friday morning, early Friday morning for me. Um, so just as a reminder to everybody, and I'll remind everybody before every talk, if you have a question, you should put it into the chat. Um, or else, if you want to um, ask your question aloud, please raise your hand and that way it'll be easy for me to find you in the attendee list and to unmute you after each talk. Uh, each talk will take approximately 30 minutes with 20 minutes for the talk and 10 minutes for the question period. And we'll try to stick to time as best as possible. So we'll start right away with uh, Maggie Baird from UMass Amherst, who will be talking about deriving frequency effects from biases in learning. All right. Can everyone see this and hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maggie. I'm a grad student at UMass. Um, and today I'll be presenting a new sort of learning model um, for deriving frequency effects. Um, oh, how do I? Okay, there we go. Um, so today I'll be presenting a new phonological learner that derives frequency effects for particular, in particular phonological reduction and deletion processes. Um, this is a bidirectional maxent learner that uses Bayesian inference. And I'm hoping to show that the biases in this learner explain how frequency effects arise. Um, so I'll be starting by giving a, a general introduction to sort of where I'm situating myself in this theoretical world. Um, and then we'll go through a pretty detailed um, step through of how the learner actually works and finally show some results um, from a case study of TD deletion in English. So as should be relatively familiar, frequency is a factor that can condition variable phonological processes. And notably, uh, there's a tendency for reduction and deletion processes to have higher rates um, for higher frequency words as compared to lower frequency words. So for example, um, you know, the word just has a much higher likelihood of deleting that final T than the word just. Um, and today when I refer to frequency, I'll always be talking about uh, token frequency. Um, when I talk about sort of how often a, a particular word goes undergoes a process, I'll always be using the term rate of application um, because frequency you know, means different things in different contexts, so I'll try to be really consistent. Um, so there's plenty of analyses in the literature for frequency effects, um, but one that I think is a really great analysis um, is this Kutsia and Kawahara paper, um, which is a noisy harmonic grammar model with lexically scaled constraints, and the scale is over faithfulness constraints in particular. The scale on the constraints is determined by a linking function, uh, and the scales on the weights, sorry, uh, by a linking function with frequency. And so the, there is a built-in relationship that higher frequency will have lower faithfulness. Um, and their paper is really about determining sort of the strength and exactly what this scale looks like um, and sort of mathematically deriving and understanding this linking function and what it might look like in different languages. And I think the model does a really great job of capturing the phonological patterns that we see, but it does stipulate this relationship between frequency and faithfulness. My model today does not have that stipulation. In principle, the learner I'm presenting is able to learn any kind of relationship or not learn any relationship at all between frequency and faithfulness. So today we'll be sort of approaching frequency effects from a listener oriented perspective, which in very broad strokes, strokes terms um, can sort of be conceived as the phonetic pressure to reduce being balanced against comprehension recovery for the listener. So the idea that the goal of language is comprehension and we want to minimize perceptual difficulty for our listener. At the same time, we also want to have some kind of phonetic reduction for ourselves, um, which is preferable um, just from sort of a, uh, an automation or an articulatory point of view. So my major argument here is that more frequent words license more reduction and deletion because they are more easily recovered by the listener. So the model I'll be presenting today is a bidirectional grammar, um, which is one way of sort of formalizing this listener orientedness in phonological learning. Um, and the, the basic point of a bidirectional grammar is that we have one grammar which is used both in perception and production. And the way I implement this is by having two distinct learning steps for learning the weights on the constraints, one, excuse me, in per production and one in perception. 
So the basic model is a maximum entropy grammar with lexically indexed markedness constraints. And the lexically indexed constraints allow the model to learn individual rates of application for each word. Um, so the production step is a very sort of vanilla traditional Maxent learner. It's an online learner updated with stochastic gradient descent. And if you're not familiar with the ins and outs of different Maxent learning algorithms, um, this is sort of a bird's eye, non-mathematical way of thinking about it, um, which is in our update, we select a UR from the lexicon, we select an SR from the observed input data, we, generated, we generate an expected SR from the current weights of the grammar, and then we see if those two SRs match. And if they don't match, we update the weights um, towards favoring the observed SR over the expected SR. So let's take a look at what sort of information we need to actually implement a Maxent model. So let's imagine we have this very tiny lexicon of uh, just and jest. Um, so we'll have some kind of uh, lexical item with URs. Those come with frequencies, which is how we sample the URs from their relative frequencies, which we can calculate. And then, you know, based on some corpus data or whatever we have access to, we can input the observed rates of the different SRs of these URs. So uh, just might appear with a deleted T 90% of the time, whereas just is, just is only appearing with the deleted t 10% of the time. Um, and then if we had a really simple grammar with a, a max constraint and a star consonant alveolar stop constraint, as well as an index version of that constraint for each words, all initialized at one, um, the current weights of the grammar would predict something like this um, for the expected distributions of these SRs. And over time, these numbers are going to start to look like these numbers as we update the weights. So in addition to the learning step, which maps from UR to SR, this learner also has another step, which is the novel addition um, that I posit. So the learner is given the expected SR, which again is generated by the weights of the grammar from the first step, and it attempts to map it back to a UR. And this mirrors the real world process of hearing a phonetic form and mapping it back to a lexical item. So uh, the general sort of conceit of a constraint-based grammar is mapping from a lex uh, an abstract sort of lexical representation to a phonetic form. We're doing that process from the reverse. Now we're imagining that the grammar is a listener rather than a speaker, which is receiving a phonetic form and attempting to map it back to a lexical item to understand which word was uttered essentially. So now our learning process looks a little something like this. Our production step is the same as I explained before, but now we take this expected SR that we generated and we pass it on to a comprehension based update. So I envision the comprehension process as a Bayesian inference problem. So the learner is calculating the probability of URs given this SR and creating a probability distribution over URs. So with Bayes' law, uh, the probability of UR given SR is the probability of SR given UR times probability of UR over probability of SR. And the way that I define these terms is as follows. Um, P of SR given a UR is the current probability assigned to the SR by the grammar's weights for a given UR. P of UR is the prior probability of selecting a UR from the lexicon, which is estimated as, a, as the relative frequency of a UR. And then the P of SR is the sum of the probabilities of all of the possible ways of generating the SR. So we're dividing all, uh, we're dividing over all of the possible ways of generating this SR to create our probability distribution. And if we look at our data, we actually don't need to add anything to the model to have access to this information. The probability of the URs is just their relative frequencies, which is information we already needed to do online learning. And then the probability of an SR given a UR is just taken from this section of the grammar, which is being calculated by the weights. So let's say in our comprehension step, we were fed the form uh, just. Well, the probability of just given just is 0.73. And the probability of just given just is zero because it's not in here. In reality, Maxent doesn't ever predict absolute zero, but it's basically zero. Um, so we consider the probability of every UR in the lexicon generating the SR, but we also consider that this could be a new word, right? So this is a UR that's not yet in the lexicon. So if you mishear something, um, and you, let's say you hear the word test without the T, you hear someone say test, and for some reason you're not able to reconstruct that they meant to say test, you might imagine that this is some new word you haven't heard that the kids are using, and so you create a new lexical entry. 
And the way that I instantiate this is that new word is a UR in our lexicon and it has a pseudo count N, which is set by the analyst. Um, and the probability of the UR new word um, is just the relative frequency of N across the entire lexicon. So selecting the UR new word in the comprehension step represents positing your heard SR as a new lexical item. And here I assume that if we're positing new word is a uh, new, uh, if we're positing that the SR we heard is a new word, we imagine that it's fully faithful. So if I hear someone say tests and I think it's a word I don't know, I imagine that it's just tests and that's its SR and also its UR. So the P of SR given the UR new word is one. So now our data, our lexicon looks just a little bit different. We're gonna add a word to our lexicon called new word. And the UR of new word is just the SR that we're considering. So remember that this is online learning, meaning we're only considering one data point at a time. So during this comprehension step, we have one SR that we're considering and new word is the UR of the SR that we heard. It has a frequency, which is just a parameter in the model. It has a relative frequency, which we calculate over the entire lexicon. And then this P of SR given the UR is gonna be 100% because we're again, assuming that this, uh, you, uh, this SR um, and it is just a fully faithful form of the UR. So in the comprehension step, the model creates a probability distribution over possible URs that could have generated the SR and it samples from that distribution. The likelihood of choosing to attribute the SR to a new word rather than the correct UR is inversely proportional to the probability of the correct UR given the SR, which in turn is dependent on the frequency of the correct UR. So let's look at this. If we're sort of considering, um, you know, perhaps the form just, um, and we're multiplying these numbers together, as well as this number with this number, just is going to have a, you know, a relatively large share of that probability distribution. But if we were considering one of these forms of just, uh, maybe just, um, its prior probability being so low means it has a much smaller share of the probability distribution. We're much more likely to make an error and say that, oh, this must have been a new word rather than correctly understanding that it was just. So if the selected UR is correct, there's no update. But if the selected UR is incorrect, either the learner selected that this was a new word or they chose just the wrong UR, there's an error and a learning update occurs. But in this case, the weights are updated not towards the observed SR like we saw in the production step, but towards the faithful form. And the reasoning behind this is that the listener did not correctly comprehend the intended word. And now the speaker somehow receives that feedback and they learn that they should be more faithful through this word to understand, to ensure that they will be understood. Um, so uh, the sort of assumption that I'm making is that the speaker is trying to reduce or delete in order to you know, make their articulation easier. But if that leads to a comprehension error where they're not being understood, they're going to receive that feedback and learn that they shouldn't do that for this word because they won't be understood and therefore they should pronounce it more faithfully, um, which will lead to a higher chance of their listener understanding the word. So more frequent items are easier to recover for the listener. They have a higher prior probability and they're gonna generate comprehension errors less often. So over time through the course of learning, lower frequency items have more promoted faithfulness than higher frequency items. So now our entire learning setup looks something like this. Um, we, after we give the uh, SR to the comprehension based update, we calculate the probability of UR given SR for all of our URs and new word. We sample from that distribution. We check if the sampled UR matches the UR from step one up here. If not, we update the weights to favor the faithful form of the UR. And then we go back to step one, we choose a new UR and we do it all over again. So the model that I'm presenting today is, is intended to derive patterns of frequency over time. It's not intended to capture synchronic data. Um, so with lexically index constraints, it's really easy to learn different rates of application for lexical for every lexical item. So if I give a learner uh, a bunch of words and a bunch of rates of deletion of their final consonant, and I have lexically index constraints, it's going to be able to learn that distribution, which doesn't really tell us anything interesting about the actual learning process itself. 
Um, so to avoid this, I input all of the data saying that the observed rate of reduction or deletion is 100% for every word. This is essentially trying to capture this articulatory pressure to reduce or delete, saying the observed grammar, the grammar that we're trying to learn is just to um, reduce or delete um, as much as we possibly can. Um, but in the outputs, our distribution is going to look very different and we're, the lower frequency words are going to get the lowest rates of reduction or deletion. Um, and so in the modeling, the biases will yield the frequency effects on the surface, although they were not present in the input data. So we're putting in completely neutral data um, where we're saying to reduce delete as much as you possibly can, but the, learn, the biases in the model will give us output data that looks like what we actually see on the surface. And so the, the sort of explanatory power here is this listener-oriented account that shows where frequency effects come from in language and why we see them cross-linguistically. And so this finally is what our actual data looks like where our observed percentages for the deleted form are gonna be 100% for every word. So we're gonna look at a, a test case really quickly. I'm running out of time here. Um, so a very famous case of TD deletion in English where more frequent words tend to delete the T or the D more often. And I'll be taking uh, the data from this C and K paper that I've mentioned before uh, and the data from the Buckeye corpus. The Buckeye corpus is quite small. And so it's difficult to get reliable estimates, especially for lower frequency words, which might only have one token in the corpus. And so we can't actually evaluate a reliable rate of deletion for those words. And so what they do is they create bins of data that span 0.1 on the log scale and combine these bins for a total uh, to make sure they each have enough tokens. And so there's a total of 23 bins. In their modeling, um, the rate of deletion is the overall rate for each bin. And again, in my input, all of the bins are input with 100% deletion, but we'll be comparing to um, this overall rate. They Today, we're modeling just the pre-consonantal data. Uh, we have a very simple constraint set with a max constraint and a star consonant alveolar stop word finally constraint, which also has index versions, which are indexed each bin. So again, in this model, our lexicon doesn't have words, it has bins, but they behave just like as if they were words. Um, so the highest frequency bin accounts for 84% of the data, meaning the learning process needs to be relatively long to make sure that we're seeing each of the words in our lexicon enough times that they're actually being learned from. So the learning was run for 2 million steps um, with a learning rate of 0 0.02 and all of our weights were initialized at one. And this is what it looks like. Um, so here in the black dotted line with the actual data, we have these 23 different bins um, and their rates of deletion. And then the blue line is my model's prediction. So remember that in the input, all of these points were just a straight line at 100, but in the output, we see this really beautiful uh, line that has this positive correlation between the rate of deletion and the frequency. And this positive correlation is really what I was going for. Um, so that correlation is not there in the data. And because of the way that um, the constraints are set up, it could have learned the exact opposite pattern. It's entirely possible it would have learned no pattern at all. Um, but the fact that it gets this positive correlation is, is a really fantastic result. Um, and so I will com be comparing the results to the CNK model, but it's important to note that they have sort of different goals and setup. Their model is a very sort of traditional way of capturing language learning in a synchronic sense, um, whereas my model is a little bit more about uh, showing where these patterns might arise over time because of biases that we have. Um, and so this is a comparison between uh, our models here. So this dotted black line represents their baseline, which is a um, which is uh, a noisy harmonic grammar uh, without any scale. So it doesn't have the ability to learn different rates for the different bins, and it's a line at about seventy nine percent predicted for everything. The actual data is in blue. I apologize. I know mine was in blue on the last slide. Uh, theirs is in yellow, and mine is in green. So we can see that they look pretty similar. We get this positive trend. Uh, mine is a little bit bumpier. There's a little more straight and theirs doesn't get quite as high for this last 
uh, bin, but they look relatively the same. And I wanna point out again that I'm not trying to do better than their model. Um, actually doing just as well is a huge success because I'm trying to get at the same data by stripping away some assumptions in the modeling and taking a different uh, modeling perspective and showing that I can get to the same sort of representation of the surface patterns um, from a different sort of point of view. Um, but to present some quantitative results, they calculate the percentage and mean squared error improvement over their baseline. Uh, and theirs is 75.83%. Uh, and my average um, over 20 runs was 76.96%. There is variation in the output, but the positive relationship is always there. I won't go into detail about this slide because I'm running out of time. Um, we can talk about it after. Uh, and so to conclude, I think this model has really interesting explanatory power for the emergence of frequency effects. Uh, it derives frequency effects through a comprehension-based update that biases the data towards more reduction and deletion for higher frequency items because they are more easily recovered. It's able to take unbiased data and through learning derive the surface patterns we see cross-linguistically without stipulating any kind of particular relationship. Thank you. Great, thank you, Maggie. Thanks for a very interesting talk. All right, are there any questions from the audience? Again, I'd like to remind you, you're welcome to put them in the chat and I can call on you or read out your question out loud myself or better yet, if you raise your hand in the, um, the Zoom feature at the bottom, then I can find you in the attendee list and unmute you so that you can uh, ask your question aloud. Don't be shy. Any questions? Okay, well, I, I have a question. I'll recognize myself first. Maybe I can get things started. Um, so uh, the model appears to assume that the underlying representation of the alternating form can only contain a T or a D. Is it like, so there's an optional deletion process rather than, you know, potentially an optional appenthesis pro uh, process. Is there any consideration given to that possibility? Would that cause any difference in the results of the model or anything like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about that particularly with TD deletion, but um, I think it's an interesting question, especially because um, these frequency effects we sort of see with particular phonological processes, but not all of them. So like we, there is plenty of phonology, um, which doesn't have to do with sort of um, like lenition or sort of like articulatory laziness for lack of a better word that might not show these same sort of um, effects coming from frequency. And there's nothing in principle in the model that is actually saying that right like there there are i'm i'm trying to talk about these patterns that we see in reduction processes in particular but there's nothing about the model or the actual constraints that says that um you could put completely different constraints in a bunch of different data and it would make predictions that might not necessarily be true for a different phonological process so that's something i have not uh, sort of worked out yet, but it's something that I definitely want to look into in the future um, and, and really think about why it is that there's some things in phonology that behave this way and there's other phonological things that don't behave this way. Great, thank you. All right, I'll give everybody who's still waking up another opportunity to ask some questions before I have another. Again, in the chat or preferably raising your hand so that I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Yes, Jennifer Smith, please. Um, I think, oh gosh, now how does this work? Now I can unmute you, I think. Yes, oh, you can unmute yourself, awesome. Yes, sorry, um, hi, this is Jen Smith. I'm actually sharing my computer with Elliot Morton and he's got the question. Sorry, um, thanks for a nifty talk. Um, have you, what happens when you iterate the learning? When you feed the output of one of one learning learner to the to as the input to the next, yes, uh, I don't know, but that is what I am so excited about pursuing. This is the next step of the project. Um, I think it has so much potential. I'm so excited to see if we can actually take this and maybe see how like like hypothetically how a language would evolve over time, potentially like stopping the learning before it got to where it got to and then passing that as the inputs to a next learner. Um, that is something that I'm thinking about a ton. 
I'm really, really excited about it, but I don't have anything to say yet. Okay. So you don't know if there's any fixed points, if there's, if it's, if there's some distribution, if, if, if it's all going to collapse to, to some flat distribution, or if there's some particular shape that, that's, a, that, that's a fixed point where, okay. Yeah, no, I really don't know. Um, uh, it's this really interesting like model because I'm taking this like, you know, algorithm of stochastic gradient descent, which is going to find an optimum. And then I'm explicitly pushing it away from that optimum um, and putting it in a completely different direction. Um, so it's really, really difficult to say if the learning is constrained at all or what the behavior might be. Um, because I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm ex explicitly put, pushing it away from this point that it's trying to find. And so I think it would be really interesting uh, to look at the behavior. There's, I mean, there's so many directions I wanna go with this project. This is, this is just the very beginning, um, but iterated learning is, is, a, is a really big direction. And I, uh, I'm really curious to see, to see what it could say about the patterns that we see. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you for the question, Elliot. Any others, any other attendees wanting to ask any questions? We still have a, a few more minutes. Okay, I'll go ahead with, oh no, sorry, Ivy. Ivy Hauser has a question. Thank you, Ivy. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Thanks for the talk. So I was kind of piggybacking on, I think Eric's uh, question helped me formulate what I was thinking about. I'm wondering if, this could be extended to effects, frequency effects that are below the segment level. So you're looking at whether there's a T or not a T, right? I'm thinking about whether a similar modeling could be done for frequency effects that are like VOT. So if we think about how um, words like, you know, time versus the time uh, herb, Generally, we get a longer VOT for the less frequent one. So we could view that as a kind of lenition on the frequent words. Um, do you see that as being controlled by something different? Could your model be extended to account for that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I haven't thought about that a ton. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that for me, a lot of that would come down to sort of the constraint set, like the Borsma and Hamm and bidirectional grammar is very sort of more explicitly phonetic than my, I'm using very traditional phonological constraints, but I just have this sort of different learning setup. Their model is very much, you know, they have constraints that are talking about phonetic properties. They have constraints that are saying what the formant values are and things like that. And so that's sort of a very different way of approaching this sort of like bi-directional grammar. Um, so I haven't thought a lot about that because I think that has a lot more to do with the constraint set or what you want to put in the sort of into phonology. Um, whereas I'm taking a more sort of traditional phonological process uh, that interacts with this sort of extra, extra, grammatical, extra grammatical influence. Um, but it's, it's saying very phonological, but I think now that, you know, I have this bidirectional grammar that is, you know, it's mapping from phonetics back to the lexicon. Um, I think that, you know, it could be used to do things like that. And I think it's a really big theoretical question of whether it should be used for that or mm -hmm. not. And sort of how much of that should be in phonology and should be in the grammar at all. Um, I'm, I am from, I'm not, as familiar with that data, frankly, I'm, I was just really considering these more sort of traditional reduction processes, but that's a really interesting direction to think about. Cool, thanks. All right. Well, in the interest of time, or unless there was any other questions, uh, very quick questions, but it's already 930. So in the interest of time, why don't we just continue and thank Maggie very much for a very interesting talk. Okay, so next up is uh, Kanan Bryce of UCLA, who will be talking about base effects or probabilistic, a case study in lexical conservatism. Conservatism, sorry. <laughs> the events of this week obviously have me very uh, confused. Go ahead, Kanan. That's fair. Um, let me try and share my screen do the, the pre talk ritual of can everyone see this? Um, yes. 
Yes, okay. I want to make sure that it's large. Is this working for everyone? I believe so. Awesome, cool. Okay, okay. thanks a lot, Eric. Um, hi, everyone, virtually. Uh, I'm sorry to not be seeing you all in person this year. Um, hopefully next year it will be a lot different. Um, today I'll be talking about um, lexical conservatism um, with a kind of larger view on questions about grammar and lexicon interaction um, that kind of build on maybe a little bit of a different angle what Maggie was just talking about. So first off, what is lexical conservatism? Um, lexical conservatism is a theory put forward by Stereotti in the late 90s um, that basically posits a dependency between the way uh, novel words uh, behave phonologically. Um, I'm going to call these novel words derivatives um, and the existence of phonologically advantageous morphologically related lexical items. So this sounds very abstract. Let's give an example. Um, Let's compare um, the words compensate and inundate. Um, phonologically, they're very simple, uh, similar rather, um, but under affixation with able. Um, so if you want to say something can be compensated, it is um, compensable. One would not say compensable. Um, whereas with inundate, you get inundable, not inundable. Um, why should this be? Uh, well, lexical conservatism holds that because the local base um, compensate has a morphologically related form uh, compensatory that I'd be calling the remote base, um, it ha which has a uh, right shifted uh, stress. Um, this is not true of inund inundate. There are no forms in inund. And so the presence of the phonologically advantageous remote base compensatory, uh, the compense uh, stress placement better satisfies uh, star lapse. And so it licenses a derivative, which it can inherit those properties. Um, so put another way, speakers are lexically conservative in only using or only mostly wanting to use already existing allomorphs when forming derivatives. Um, why study lexical conservatism, um, especially in the lab? Um, well, it's very broadly attested outside English. Um, if people know of more languages than these, let me know. I'd be happy to add them to my collection. Um, however, there's very little detailed experimental work. And I think there's much to be gained from this because uh, the theory, as you may have intuited, makes very strong claims about what the relationship is between the lexicon and the grammar, what kind of factors about the lexicon can influence the behavior of the grammar and vice versa. Um, so I think I'll hope to demonstrate that by probing this uh, experimentally, we can learn a lot about um, what we should be doing with our phonological theories and how to enhance them. So in this talk, I'll be presenting two experiments on lexical conservatism in English stress. Um, I hope to demonstrate that uh, the phenomenon is robust, but also probabilistic. Um, and I'm going to argue that, theoretically speaking, contemporary theories of lexical grammar interaction are ill-equipped to handle this particular kind of uh, phenomenon. So base effects more generally, but here with the context of lexical conservatism. Um, and I'm going to propose a model where the lexical effects observed, uh, the lexical characteristics of remote base on the derivative um, that are observed in lexical conservatism follow naturally from the architecture of the grammar. So uh, let's go on to experiment one. Um, experiment one is a very classical thing that phonologists love to do. Um, it's a free response bug test. Um, 31 undergrads uh, participated. This took place in the before times. So this was all in a sound booth. Um, and the stimuli, which are I think the most important part of the experiment are as follows. There are two kinds of species of stimuli. There are uh, stimuli that I took directly from Seriati's original 1997 paper. Um, so I just wanted to replicate her results directly. Um, and then I also added new stimuli. Um, and cross-cutting with this kind of distinction, there are uh, half of the local bases um, had remote, had phonologically advantageous remote bases. So in the case of demonstrate, um, there's right shifted uh, stress in morphologically related demonstrative, infiltrate, uh, filter, that kind of thing. Um, uh, parent parental, pirate piratical, um, and then there are some other local bases to act as a control condition that don't have this advantageous remote base. So dedicate, irrigate, spinach, spandex, that kind of thing. Um, I chose four affixes. Um, I can talk more about this in detail if you'd like me to in the question period. Um, I combined Ubble and ism with the local bases from Stereotti's paper and iddy and defy uh, modulo a small experimental error, uh, which I can talk about if you'd like. Um, were combined with the novel local bases. Um, this created um, 234 possible derivatives, um, and I gave each one a carrier phrase, um, which is kind of semantically neutral, but contains a local base. So people saw sentences like an ideology centered on illustrating could be called 
and they would have to how, decide how to pronounce this word, illustrism or illustrism. Uh, so the experiment took place in three broad phases. Um, first, uh, each uh, participant completed the like, full conservatism task. They read through the sentence silently uh, and then said the derivative, the last word aloud. And then I noted the stress placement in the derivative, what syllable it was on. Um, and then they read aloud indicated knowledge of each of the local and remote bases in the uh, study. So they only ever saw local bases, but they could potentially have been calling on remote bases. Um, and so I wanted to be able to compare each speaker's uh, productions to their own lexicon, rather than sort of assuming that all speakers knew all words. Um, and then they did a language background questionnaire. Uh, for, like I just said, for each participant, um, the derivatives were coded based on whether they knew the local base and the remote base. Um, and uh, I analyzed the data using uh, Bayesian hierarchical logistic regression. Um, so I'm going to really downplay the stats here just for the sake of simplicity and time, but all of the effects discussed here have greater than 95% probability of a true effect um, or a non-null effect unless otherwise noted. So in the statistical analysis, we're looking at two classes of factors. Um, First, very kind of garden variety, uh, mom and apple pie uh, phonological factors influencing the placement of stress in English. So syllable weight, um, whether the target syllable, that is to say this syllable which would bear stress in the derivative if stress shifted, um, whether it was secondarily stressed or not, um, and also affects identity. I also looked at three lexical factors. So most importantly, did the participant know the relevant remote base, which was supposed to help them out? Um, yes or no? Um, this is kind of, does lexical conservatism hold as an effect is diagnosed by this point. Um, again, then if it is known, I looked at the, whether there was an effect of log frequency of the remote base, as well as semantic similarity of the local and remote bases. Um, so kind of very broadly, um, we can ask, does lexical conservatism hold? Um, the answer is yes. Derivatives formed from local bases with known remote bases, phonologically advantageous ones, mismatch their local base in stress placement um, more often than those without. So let me walk you through this graph. This is sort of the, the ex exemplar of all the way the graphs are gonna look in this talk. On the vertical axis is proportion um, of uh, forms where the derivatives matched stress, uh, stress matched their local base. So up is faithful, um, so uh, illustrism, down is unfaithful, illustrism. Um, and the panels are whether the remote base was known or not known. Um, and I just bend these into the words for stereoti and the new words just to make sure that yes, all of stereoti's original stimuli work and also all of the novel stimuli work. Um, so as you can see, when the remote base is known, bars are lower is the main takeaway from here, um, which indicates that the knowing the remote base has an effect, all other things equal. Um, however, as you can see, bars are not at ceiling or at floor. The effect is probabilistic. So this means there are exceptions in both directions. When uh, there are certain cases when someone might know the word illustrative, um, but not act like, act like it when they form their derivative, they might say illustrism. Um, and then there are cases when they might not know the word illustrative, but they still violate faithfulness to the local base and say uh, illustrism. Um, so phonological factors are certainly in play here as well. Um, let me walk you through these graphs. Can I zoom here? Is this going to work nicely? Oh, maybe not. Okay, never mind. Um, so these are the phonological influences on derivative formation. Um, on the left, we see uh, whether the target syllable is heavy. Um, yes in blue, um, no in red. So you can see that uh, having a heavy syllable makes you more likely to attract stress. Um, same with having a secondarily stressed syllable. Um, and then over here, these are just affix identities. So I'll, um, each affix has sort of its own particular little propensity to attract or not attract stress. Um, and across most of these graphs, you can see that things, uh, the kind of bars on the left panel are lower than bars on the right panel, indicating that when there is a remote base, things are more generally unfaithful. Um, turning to the lexical influences, the non-remote base existence lexical influences, I guess, we can see uh, pretty mixed effect, mixed uh, results. So this is uh, a very similar kind of graph. On the vertical axis, there's the predicted probability of a derivative matching the local base. Um, and on the horizontal axis, here is a log frequency of the remote base, uh, centered and scaled. So lower frequencies on the left, higher frequencies on the right. And on, in the right panel, 
there's semantic similarity between local and remote base. So more semantically dissimilar local and remote bases like filter and infiltrate um, on the left and on the right, um, product and productive, things like that, um, which are more semantically similar. Um, and these bars, uh, the, the gray are, uh, areas are 95% credible intervals. So they look very wide, but that's because that's basically all of the possible uh, effects that could be in there. And most of the probable effects are closer to this blue line. So we can find, we see that higher uh, log frequency of remote bases um, means that they're more likely to be unfaithful. The derivatives are more likely to be unfaithful to the local base stress placement. So more frequent remote bases have an effect, um, more of an effect than lower frequency remote bases, but we don't really see the same effect for uh, semantic similarity. So let's briefly, briefly summarize. Um, we've seen so far that lexical conservatism replicates in the lab, hooray. Um, the effect is probabilistic. Um, we find phonological determinants that are well understood and well known, um, as well as the existence of, a lex of the remote base playing a role. So that's a lexical effect that matters. Um, but other lexical characteristics are kind of weak. They, you know, frequency is there, but it's a little bit faint. Semantic similarity doesn't do much. So given this information, what kind of analytical possibilities are there on the table for capturing both the lexical and the phonological effects? I'm going to talk primarily about the lexical effects here because they're the most difficult to model. Um, there are kind of two broad species of approach. Um, one is diacritic, where speakers actually represent local bases that happen to have a, a remote base as with a special diacritic, like an alphabet diacritic plus remote base or something like that. Um, and then faithfulness constraints are sensitive to this diacritic and everything just dances through um, the normal phonological grammar uh, like you would expect with any kind of index constraint. Um, there's another model, which I will formalize a little bit more later, um, but it's a dynamic model where speakers actually lexically access, they kind of rummage around their lexicon and pull up uh, the lexical entries of both local and remote bases in real time while they're doing this task. Um, and so the lexical influences of the remote base are direct, not mediated by a diacritic in the representation. Um, this is tricky to formalize, and I'll get to this a little bit later. Um, we can distinguish between these two possibilities, however, using a priming task. So if the remote base is actually being lexically accessed during derivative formation, during the bug test, doing something that increases its uh, resting activation, um, like priming it and making it e easier to access, um, should have an impact on how it forms, the, on how it, uh, interacts with the derivative formation process. However, if it's simply a diacritic on the local base, then fussing around with a remote base uh, isn't really gonna do anything. Um, so experiment two also uh, incorporates, uh, I should, I'll, this is a little bit of a side note. Um, experiment two incorporates a phonotactic judgment task. I'm not gonna talk about it here. Um, however, there are slides in the appendix if you're curious how uh, phonotactic and alternation marketedness relate to this whole situation. So uh, in experiment two, the setup was very similar, except I had just fewer stimuli because the experiment was longer. Um, so half of the local bases had remote bases, product productive, context contextual, um, and 20 without, nylon, onion, um, that kind of thing. And I only used two affixes this time. Uh, five phases, uh, there was a pre-task knowledge check. So as in experiment one, I wanted to compare participants uh, not, uh, productions of the derivative to their own lexical knowledge rather than sort of an abstract or hypothesized universal lexicon. Um, and so they were asked to produce and indicate knowledge of all the local bases before doing the task, plus alternating counterbalanced halves of the remote bases. So if they're asked, hey, do you know the word contextual as well as, hey, do you know the word context before doing lexical conservatism task, that's supposed to prime the remote base contextual um, in their lexicon. Um, Whereas uh, in cases where the contextual was asked about afterwards, then um, that's not primed. Um, so after they do the pre-task knowledge check, uh, do do the lexical interest and task as usual, then I just get the knowledge information. Do they know the word contextual um, if it wasn't primed afterwards? And then they do the phonotactic judgment task um, and language background questionnaire. Uh, data and analysis followed experiment one. Um, the phonological factors are more or less the same that I'm going to be looking at. Um, and the lexical factors are very similar also, but they're a little bit more in depth here. So we have not only the binary lexical characteristic of like, do they know the remote base? Um, but also if they know the remote base, was the remote base uh, primed for them? Um, uh, log frequency of the remote base, semantic similarity, as well as interaction between these two factors and uh, priming, such that if you, if you raise the, the resting activation of 
lexical item, you expect that it might kind of change how its other lexical non phonological properties interact with uh, the grammar as well. Um, so showing this is just the phonological effect. Um, my apologies, uh, there is a major graphical design error uh, boo boo here. And now on the left, it is cases where the remote base is not known. Um, oops, there's someone in the chat. Am I out of time? Okay, almost, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna skip over this. It's uh, fairly evident. Things where the remote base is known um, are less likely to be faithful to the local base. Um, yes, turning now to the lexical influences on derivative formation, we find a priming effect such that if the remote base is primed, it is less likely the derivatives of that local base are less likely to be faithful to the uh, local base. Um, and then we also find the interaction of priming with semantic similarity such that only if uh, such that more semantically similar remote bases are uh, exert more of an effect on the derivative, but only if they're primed. So this explains why we didn't see that effect in experiment one. Um, we see a really kind of disappointing null result for remote frequent uh, remote base log frequency. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that in uh, the question period if you're curious. So again, to quickly sum up, we find the knowledge of the remote base matters, and further priming the remote base influences its uh, the way it impacts the derivative. Um, this is theoretically important because it supports the dynamic analysis. So let's zoom out a little bit. Um, how are we going to model these? And how am I going to talk about this in only five minutes? Um, well, theoretically speaking, um, in terms of framework, we need a probabilistic framework that allows for constraint gaining. So maxim, uh, max end or NHG will do the trick. This is not new news in, in terms of phonological phenomena. Um, and the mechanisms for this in terms of particular constraints are actually already fairly well sketched out. So I'm not going to give a detailed analysis uh, here. I'd be happy to share a paper with you where that information is available. Um, send me an email. Um, however, I'd be focusing more on how do we, what's the best way to incorporate the lexical effects of the remote base into or not incorporate them into our phonological model. Um, so classes of theories for lexicon phonology interaction on the market fall into two kind of camps. There are lexical listing accounts, like the dual root model, where um, exceptional words or variants are lexically listed uh, wholesale. And there are indexation accounts, like index constraint theory, cophonologies, hierarchical maxent, where um, specific morphemes are indexed with constraints or rankings or weightings that allow them to diverge from grammar-wide behavior. So put another way, existing theories use the lexicon to explain phonological behavior that is difficult to motivate using phonological means. Um, which is, in my opinion, completely reasonable. Um, however, this won't do for lexical conservatism. Um, lexical listing accounts aren't appropriate because definitionally the derivatives people are making are nonces, or at least I hope they're nonces. No one should have needed to have said illustrism in their life before, uh, before I come along and force them to. Uh, and indexation accounts can explain the existence of the remote base effect via this kind of diacritic or constraint that has a similar effect. Um, but it can't explain uh, the priming or the semantic effects. Um, so this is because lexical conservatism, uh, the remote base enables phonologically natural behavior, which would otherwise be blocked by the grammar. So this is kind of the reverse of existing, uh, what existing frameworks do. So I'm gonna suggest uh, here that architecturally speaking, lexical conservatism, or at least the lexical effects of lexical conservatism shouldn't be modeled as part of the phonological grammar per se and actually emerge as a byproduct of lexicon grammar relationship. Um, so if lexical conservatism were a part of the grammar, we would expect it to do grammar-like things. So we should expect languages like English prime, where, uh, oh, this is a pun, unintendedly, um, priming reduces the probability of the derivative resembling the remote base. Um, we should have constraints in con or learned like star b low resting activation and star b semantically dissimilar. Um, this is the wrong tool for the job, I feel. Um, Thanks, uh, I propose, on the other hand, that the lexicon should act as a prior on the grammar. Um, so uh, where the phonological grammar kind of on, operates on top of the lexicon, which acts as the prior over what URs are used or how likely those URs are to be realized in SRs, I guess. Um, this lex renders lexical conservatism akin to stem allomorph selection, but is driven by phonological and lexical forces. So different candidate SRs are made more or less likely a priori 
depending on their UR um, and on their lexical characteristics of their UR, how semantically similar to the local base it is, how high its long run frequency and resting activation are, that kind of thing. Um, however, because it's a prior, it's a, it's a soft bias, it can be overridden by overwhelming phonological considerations. Like it would really suck to say illustrism instead of illustrism, if you happen to feel that way. Um, this can be formalized by a constraint like uh, star UR for each local and remote base. And then gen lists all possible changes to each UR um, and affix combination. So very briefly, um, this looks a little bit like this. This is not a full analysis. Um, this is just uh, your, can't, your input is, I want to have the idea of pirate plus the affix ubble because I've been told I have to add ubble in this experiment. Um, and then your candidates are, well, do I use pirate plus ubble? Um, and realize it as piratable? Do I use pirate plus ubble and realize it as piratical? Do I use pirat from uh, piratical uh, and be unfaithful to it? This is kind of the worst case scenario. Or do I simply use the remote base? Um, and there's more that needs to be done with this to have the phonological analysis fully kind of uh, yield probabilities as one would want in a probabilistic grammar. Um, but this is the most important contribution that I think this account makes is the way the candidates in gen are set up. Um, so in conclusion, I hope to have uh, convinced you um, that uh, lexical conservatism is probabilistic um, and it's influenced by phonological well formedness principles as well as lexical characteristics of its bases. Um, I propose that uh, because of the way this works, um, lexical conservatism shouldn't be modeled directly or at least the lexical part of lexical conservatism shouldn't be modeled directly as part of the phonological grammar but rather we should think of this effect as emerging uh, from the architecture of the grammar where the lexicon functions as a prior over urs in the phonological grammar um, influencing stem allomorph selection jointly with the grammar um, and this model can be generalized and it actually is applied in my dissertation to other uh, base effects where the lexic the grammar is sensitive to the context of the lexicon um, paradigm uniformity and paradigm distinctness um, as talked about in recent lab fond plenary by Stanton and Stariati. Um, thank you all very much for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Kenan. Thanks for the very interesting talk. So we have um, some time for questions. Again, uh, you can put them in the chat and uh, or you can preferably raise your hand, your virtual hand, and I will call on you. So. With that said, are there any questions for Kanan? Looks like I might need to start things off again and I'm I'm okay doing so. Okay, so uh, Kanan, I wanted to ask you a question about the uh, affix specific propensities. Is it possible that you know you could investigate something about the phonology of the different affixes? I mean, it's not like there's a perfect minimal pair, right? If I and itty look like a minimal pair, if you just look at them, but of course they're very different phonologically. They have very similar uh, effects on the bases that they attach to, but um, but mm -hmm. you know their own phonologies might have some kind of influence on what kind of base might be preferable in each case. Is that something you've thought about? Hmm. Um, so this would be like using like in what contexts do speakers select itty versus if i to instantiate some concept of uh you know desire to make something into something or an abstract concept is that what you're asking about no no i, I think more specifically like the 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 choice the lexical the lexically specific choices that these affixes seem to exert on the realization of the base might be due to their own mm. phonological characteristics, their own the phonological characteristics of the affixes themselves. So if I has you know final stress and itty does not. Oh right, let me just go back to that. Um, I mean this is probably going to go nowhere, but I have to ask a question, and that's my question. <laughs> no, I, it's a great question. Um, I don't have anything terribly interesting to say about it, except that uh, I was faced with the possibility of do I want to do an experiment on every affix of English. Um, <laughs> And I thought, God, no, um, just because it'd be hard. Uh, so I think what this was reminiscent of to me is like, oh, look, there's lots of bi affix variation. Um, it's unclear to me how much of that is conditioned specifically by the kind of the prosodic phonology of the affix, whether in terms of subcategorization or in terms of just like stress placement on the affix itself. Um, 
and how much of that's just kind of lexically idiosyncratic uh, crud that we love dearly. Um, uh, I've done a couple other affixes in pilot experiments, like a graph, um, and they each have their own little rate. There's unfortunately not a really clean, you know, level one, level two seems to be like a very broad stroke here, but there's clearly more to be said than just like, ah, all of them behave either this way or that way. Got it, thanks. Okay, uh, Nina Caldhole has a, a question in the chat uh, saying, great talk, Kanan. And uh, she's wondering if you could go over the figures on slide 22 again. Uh, some of the details were lost on her. Of course. Um, do you mean slide 21? Maybe so. Nina, can you confirm, please? <laughs> it's showing now. Yes. Maybe is the answer. Maybe. 21, yes. Okay. 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 Um, so, yeah. So, this is the result of the lexical influences on derivative formation experiment two. So, the vertical axis again is uh, the probability of a derivative being faithful to its local base in stress placement. Um, I'm using model predicted outputs here, again, with 95% credible intervals, because trying to plot the raw data is like really hard and messy and just like is really hard to see. Um, so the fact that this uh, point is higher than this point means that if the remote base, um, so like productive, for example, um, was primed, all other things being held equal, uh, including whether the speaker knows the remote base, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if it was primed, it, the, uh, uh, the derivative form, the nonce derivative form to product um, acts differently than the nonce derivative formed uh, when it's not primed. Um, if you look at the qualities of the remote bases, specifically how semantically similar they are, um, if they are primed, they exhibit this effect where if they are more semantically similar, um, they kind of have a greater pull uh, the derivatives are less faithful to the local base. Um, whereas if they're less semantically similar, they just don't really have much of an effect um, or much of a different effect. Um, whereas they're not primed, um, this is the uh, pinkish line, um, there's not much of an effect um, on the, there's not much of a different effect based on their semantic similarity to the local base. Um, and the uh, log, the log frequency plot here is a beautiful example of absolutely nothing going on. Um, the fact that these two lines are parallel is just showing the fact that, well, primed ones are less faithful overall um, than non-primed non ones, which is what this plot shows, regardless of their frequency. Does that answer your question? Or is that uh, more clear? Yes, thank you. OK. We have you know, approximately another minute for a short question before we move on to the next talk and last talk of the session. If anyone has one. Okay, not hearing anything. I am going to say thank you to Kanan on behalf of everyone. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the great talk. And our last speaker this session is Jennifer Kuo, who will be talking about evidence for base-driven alternation in Tugudaya Se'edik. And I hope I got the pronunciation right. Thank you, Jennifer, for guidance on that. Uh, just a moment. Um, does this look good for everyone? It does, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so hello, my name is Jennifer, and today I'll be looking at evidence from Tagadaya Seedik and how it, what this can tell us about different theories in morphophonology. And as a brief note, an earlier version of this talk was presented at um, AFLA, so the first half of the talk might look a little bit familiar, but it's been updated with new experimental evidence. So as an overview, in Tagadaya Seedik, 
processes of phonological neutralization cause all forms of a verb paradigm to suffer from some kind of loss of contrasts. And this makes the language a good test case for comparing between different theories of moral phonology. Uh, in today's talk, I'm going to argue that the corpus and experimental evidence from Seedik supports an approach where the input to morphal phonology is a single surface allomorph. Um, so we can begin by looking at two different theories of morphophonological analysis. The first approach, which I'm just going to call the cobbled UR approach, is sort of the classical one laid out by Kenstowitz and Kisselberth. So here, URs aim to preserve as many contrastive properties as possible. And this means that if no single surface form is maximally informative, the resulting UR must cobble or combine information from different parts of the paradigm. So we can see how this works in this Tonkawa example here. Uh, so this is a subset of a Tonkawa paradigm. And we can see that in slot A of the paradigm, the first vowel of the stem surfaces, while in slot B of the paradigm, the second and third vowel surface. But there is no surface form in which all three vowels are present. So the cobbled UR solution would be to take information about the first vowel from slot A and information about the other vowels from slot B of the paradigm uh, to set up these URs we see on the rightmost column. So the result of this approach is that we end up with surface uh, forms being derivable from exceptionless rules and constraints. So the resulting grammar is relatively simple. Um, in contrast, there's this alternate newer approach posited by Albright uh, called the single surface space hypothesis. Uh, so here, learners designate a surface allomorph or slot in the paradigm to be a so-called privileged space. And this space, which is constrained to be the same for all stems, um, is serves, it serves as the input to morphophonology, much as the UR did in the classical theory. So for example, uh, if slot B of the paradigm were chosen to be the base, the grammar must have some mechanism, uh, such as rules or constraints for deriving slot A of the paradigm. So um, crucially in this approach of all forms of a paradigm have undergone some kind of neutralization, as is the case with Tonkawa, no base will be perfectly informative. And this means that the resulting grammars, rules or constraints will necessarily have exceptions. Uh, despite this, there is a growing body of evidence in favor of the surface-based approach uh, from areas such as historical change and child learning errors. So today I'll be looking at these two theories uh, using data from Tagdaya Seedik. So this is an Atayalic language spoken in Taiwan. And um, the dialect I'm looking at specifically is spoken primarily in Nantou, shown uh, by this arrow over here. Uh, so the population uh, in Nantou is about 6,500, uh, but the number of fluent Sedic speakers is thought to be much less than this. And um, Sedic verbs are inflected for tense, aspect, and focus through both prefixation and suffixation. So um, there's no need to get into the details of the inflection system, but um, just know that there are significant alternations between the suffixed and non-suffixed forms of verb paradigms. Uh, so examples for simplicity will all compare the bare stems with the an suffix forms shown here in blue, and the bare stems are uh, can be understood to represent all the non suffix forms. So there's various sources of morphophonological alternation in the Zedic paradigm, and today I will be talking about three of these. So first we can look at pretonic vowel reduction. So Sedek has a classic five vowel system, stress is penultimate, so suffixation will always shift stress rightwards by one syllable. And pretonically, all vowel contrasts are neutralized in a variety of ways. So first, onset list vowels will delete. So this gives us alternations such as awak with wakan. Uh, otherwise, a uh, pretonic vowel will assimilate to a following stressed vowel if the two are separated by a bottle stop or an H. And this gives us alternations such as leing with the ing an. Uh, so, barring these two processes, otherwise, vowels will reduce to u. Uh, so, we have kesa with kusa an, barah alternating with kurahan. So uh, in all these cases of pretonic vowel reduction, what we see is a loss of contrast in the suffixed forms of the paradigm. So post-tonically, a similar but more restricted process occurs in which the mid-vowels reduce to u in closed syllables. So for example, we can see that in 1a to c, uh, the final vowels of these stems are all contrastive in the suffix form when they are stressed. However, uh, all three vowels are reduced to u, neutralized to u, and post-tonic position in the isolation stem. And what we observe here is a loss of contrast in the stem forms or more generally non-suffix forms of the paradigm. Uh, 
In addition, there are various processes of final consonant neutralization, and a subset of these are shown here. So for example, in one, we see PBK neutralized the K in final position. So uh, in 1A to C, we see that these stems have contrasted final consonants in the suffix form, but all three consonants are neutralized to K in final position in the isolation stem. In two, we see that the Africa T, T and D are all neutralized to T, word finally. So this means that just given a st isolation stem that ends in t, this final consonant could potentially not alternate as an example 2a, or it could alternate with t or d. And this alternation is uh, in principle idiosyncratic and unpredictable. Uh, in addition, engma and m neutralize the engma, resulting in engma m alternations. Uh, so there's also alternations involving final G and N, but just in the interest of time, these are not discussed here. So again, as was the case with post-tonic vowel reduction, what we observe here is a loss of contrast in the stem forms. So uh, from what we've seen so far, we can see that all forms of the static verb paradigm suffer from some kind of neutralization. And in some cases, verbs can end up undergoing very extensive alternations. So an example of this is um, shown here for the word to break. We see uh, kerung in the stem form alternating with kureman in the suffix form. So we have alternation of the penultimate vowel, final vowel, and consonant. So the cobbled your approach to dealing with such alternations would be to take information about the penultimate vowel from the stem form and information about the final vowel and consonant from the suffix form uh, to cobble together this UR we see here. In contrast, under the surface base approach, we would pick either gerung or gudeman to be a base and um, the grammar would need some way of deriving the other slot of the paradigm. So crucially, these two approaches make different predictions about the types of reanalyses or errors that will take place when learners have incomplete data. Under the cobbled UR approach, the UR is determined by either the stem or the suffix form, whichever one happens to be available. In other words, reanalyses in both directions are plausible. In contrast, under the surface base approach, reanalyses will always be projected from the designated base. Uh, this means that the resulting static lexicon will have asymmetries in paradigm structure. And uh, what I mean by this will become clear in the following section. So the, in this section, I'll present some um, uh, results of a small corpus study. And um, what I find here is that suffix forms are highly predictable from stems, but stems are not as predictable from the suffix forms. And this asymmetry suggests that static speakers have identified the isolation stem specifically to be the base per Albright surface base approach. Uh, so the results shown here will be based on a corpus of 340 verb paradigms uh, taken from a combination of online dictionary data and fieldwork with three static speakers. Uh, so we can first um, consider the predictability from stem forms. So, so far we've discussed two sources of neutralization in the stems. And the question we want to ask now is, uh, can these neutralizations somehow be undone in a principled way based on statistical pre patterns of predictability in the data? So let's look at post-tonic vowel alternations first. Uh, recall that due to post-tonic vowel reduction, uh, stem, given a stem of the form CVCUC, this post-tonic U could potentially alternate with A or O in the suffix form. And this alternation is in principle idiosyncratic and unpredictable from just the stem form. Uh, however, it turns out that the identity of the vowel is highly predictable via a process of vowel matching in which the stress vowels of the stem and suffix forms tend to be the same. So for example, given a stem potus with a stressed O, the suffix form is most likely putosan. Uh, given a stem petus, the suffix form is most likely putesan. Otherwise, post-tonic U has a preference towards non-alternation and will tend to surface as U when stressed. So because of this pattern, the speaker can in principle predict with pretty high accuracy what a post-tonic U will surface as in the suffix form. Uh, so here is what the data looks like. This table here uh, compares the stress vowel of the isolation stem against the stress vowel of the suffix form in just CVCUC forms. Uh, so we can see that there is a strong correlation between um, the two. So for example, looking at this middle column, you can see that um, given a form such as putus with a stressed U, uh, the suffix form will always be putusan with a stressed U. Uh, given a form such as 
Petus with a stressed A, the suffix form will almost always be Ptesan uh, with a stressed A. And this happens for about 80% of relevant forms. As a brief note, we can see here that uh, O follows this vowel matching pattern, but appears to be pretty marginal in the lexicon. So in my entire corpus, there were only three words with um, a stressed O. So that was the data for uh, post-tonic vowel alternations, and now we can look at final consonant alternations. Uh, recall that due to final consonant neutralization, final t, k, and engma show the following alternations. And again, these alternations should be unpredictable from just the stem form, but it turns out that final consonants tend to almost always or almost never alternate. And this means that given a novel stem, a speaker could predict uh, whether or not a final consonant will alternate or not with relatively high accuracy. Uh, so the data here just shows a subset of the uh, final consonants and their rates of alternation, where the purple bars, uh, the darker bars, uh, show alternating segments. You can see first uh, on one end of the spectrum, Final engma has a strong dispreference towards alternation. So uh, given the stem such as patang, which ends in engma, the suffix form is almost always putangan with a non-alternating engma. This is true for over 90% of relevant forms. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we see that final t strongly prefers to alternate. And when it does alternate, it almost always alternates with t. So uh, given patats, the suffix form that's most likely is putatan. So overall, just looking at the stems, we see that isolation stems suffer from a loss of contrast due to post-tonic vowel reduction and final constant neutralization. However, um, because of statistical regularities in the data, uh, it ends up uh, being possible to sort of undo these neutralizations, um, predict the suffix form with relatively high accuracy. So now we can consider the other direction. So in other words, will suffix forms also be a good base? So given the suffix form of a verb, final consonants and vowels are completely predictable. However, the penultimate vowel of the stem is always neutralized due to pretonic vowel reduction. So given a suffix form such as putisan, uh, we have no principled way of knowing what this pretonic u will surface as when it becomes stressed in the stem form. So uh, it turns out that compared to the neutralizing processes we've discussed so far, the patterns of predictability that will allow speakers to undo pretonic vowel reduction are much weaker. Um, so this table here compares the stress vowel of the suffix form uh, in the x-axis against the stress vowel of the corresponding stem form. So we can use the data here to try to predict uh, the stem form given suffix forms. Uh, for example, just looking at the first column, uh, given a form such as putasan with a stressed a, the most likely stem form is patas, also with a stressed a. However, even if we pick this most likely option, we only correctly predict 39% uh, of the relevant forms. Uh, so in general, we try to undo pretonic vowel reduction in this way by picking the most likely option. Um, we would only predict about 49% of the relevant uh, forms. Uh, so this is less than half of the data. In other words, it's much harder to undo pretonic vowel reduction. Uh, adding to this, pretonic vowel reduction also affects more forms in the processes, which cause a loss of contrast in the stem. Uh, so because of these two factors, uh, the um, stem forms, the suffix forms end up being less informative. So uh, in summary, so far we've seen that there is an asymmetry in the informativeness of stem and suffix forms, such that the stems are much more informative. And although I don't show this uh, uh, data here, this uh, result was also confirmed in a rule-based model, which I adapted from Albright and Hayes' minimal generalization learner. And so now we can ask, so how exactly does this asymmetry support the surface space approach? Well, under the surface space approach, uh, the grammar would select one cell in the paradigm to be the base. In this case, it would be the stem form. And then um, the verb paradigms whose other cells are poorly predicted by the base will be leveled, and this will cause the base to become more informative. And this process will repeat over and over again as a feedback loop, um, gradually exaggerating the relative informativeness of the base. So in the case of Siddiq, we, what we see is that the isolation stem is much more informative than the suffix forms. And this asymmetry is not just attributable to phonological neutralization processes such as vowel reduction. And this suggests that restructuring from a stem base has likely happened. 
Okay, so in this final section, I'll briefly go over some experimental evidence um, in support of the STEM-based approach. So, so far, um, so the surface-based approach predicts that SADIC speakers should be able to productively generalize the patterns we've discussed so far, which make alternations predictable from the STEM. And the goal of this section is to um, test this prediction using a production study. Uh, so um, the methodology I use is a modified version of a non-sword word or WUG task. Uh, so the task was modified so that stimuli were not non-swords, but rather existing stems whose suffix forms were unknown to the CAD participants. And this choice was made after consultation with um, my um, primary CAD consultants who were concerned that using non-swords could interfere with their ongoing language revitalization processes. Uh, so the stimuli was presented to participants in both Sadiq orthography and accompanying Chinese gloss. And for each stem, speakers were asked to provide three different suffix forms. And the results I'll show today are based on 10 native speakers of Sadiq. And um, I tested both the productivity of post tonic vowel alternations and final consonant alternations. But just in the interest of time, I will only report the uh, vowel results. Uh, so the stimuli were by uh, disyllabic stems uh, and ending in closed syllables, where the penultimate vowel V1 was either A, E, or U, and then the post-tonic vowel uh, V2 was either A or U. So I'll just briefly walk over the predictions uh, based on the lexicon. So um, first, uh, post-tonic A should never alternate. So we can see these uh, first three vowel conditions, which end the post-tonic A. We expect um, uh, to always surface faithfully as a uh, when stressed. So given a stem sabak, we expect a suffix form subakan. Uh, in this bottom row here where um, we see post-tonic u, first given a stem of the form C-A-C-U-C, we expect a diff's preference for um, alternation where uh, U-E alternation should be observed in only about 20% of um, relevant forms. Uh, given a stem of the form C-E-C-U-C, uh, on the other hand, we should expect a strong preference for the UE alternation, since alternation will uh, be consistent with the vowel matching pattern. And then uh, stems of the form CUCUC should never alternate since the faithful option is also the vowel matching option. Uh, so this is what the results look like. So the top row shows the experiment data and the, uh, the bottom row is um, the lexicon, lexical um, patterns for comparison. So first, just looking at uh, these uh, left-hand three rows, we can see that um, these are all conditions where there is a post-tonic A. Ah. We can see that in all three cases, uh, speakers do what we expect, which is the uh, A uh, ah is always non-alternating. So given something like patas, the response is always putasan. And then going now to these right-hand three columns, we can first look at the rightmost column. So um, Given a stem of the form CUCUC, uh, speakers always respond with the non-alternating response. So given putus, they always respond with putusan. And this is what we expect. And uh, again, uh, with the CECUC stems, the results are consistent with the lexicon. We see a preference for um, the uh, petus putesan option in which uh, UE alternation uh, fulfills the vowel matching principle. However, results are unexpected here for CACUC stems. We see that um, in the experimental results, speakers are applying a UA alternation, giving responses such as patus with putasan. And this alternation is novel in the sense that barring some irregular forms, post toning U is uh, expected to only alternate with the mid vowels. Uh, so we can see it appears that speakers have applied a novel UA alternation uh, to fit the vowel matching pattern. So overall, it seems that at least with respect to um, post tonic vowel alternation, speakers have productively learned a vowel matching pattern, which renders the suffix forms more predictable from the stem forms. However, the grammar does uh, learned does not veridically represent the lexical distribution. And instead, speakers appear to have overgeneralized the vowel matching constraint and applied a UA alternation to CACUC stems. Um, so I have some potential explanations for why this is the case, but in the interest of time, I will skip these first. 
So just in conclusion, what we've seen so far is that based on the corpus data, the non-suffix forms of a Seidic paradigm are much more informative than the suffix forms. Um, these results are unexpected under a cobbled UR approach uh, because such an approach makes no predictions about the direction of restructuring. However, they are expected under a surface-based approach where restructuring uh, from the stem base would necessarily exaggerate uh, statistical asymmetries. And these results are further supported by evidence from a production study in which speakers generalize a vowel matching pattern. Uh, so that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for a very interesting talk. There is uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, again, if you could raise your hand, your virtual hand in the, um, in the Zoom bottom bar there, then I can call on you or you can put your question in the chat. Anyone? Okay, we have Michael Becker. Please go uh, ahead. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about this neutralization to, to the Africa tsa word finally. Um, so do you have any idea how that came to be? And um, more broadly, what do you think is the role of naturalness in your approach? So um, is it easier or to, to learn natural? Uh, uh, natural mappings? Um, should it be easier to learn map natural map mappings? Thank you. Okay, so um, about the final top, I think um, actually, so I'm not too clear about this actually, but historically, I think um, what happened was that um, to became T uh, intervocalically and D intervocalically in some cases, um, and then followed by a process of final affrication. And I'm not sure why this is the case actually, but similar of similar process has happened in a lot of neighboring dialects. And um, sorry, could you repeat your second question again? Um, the question is whether it is it should be or uh, whether it is easier to learn natural patterns in your approach and the, uh, or the, the Albright approach? Yeah, so I think um, the results I found here suggest that it is easy to learn natural patterns. So <laughs> that it's sort of hard to define what naturalness exactly is in a sense, but um, and specifically in the case of the vowel matching pattern, uh, what the lexicon reflects is, um, vowel matching constrained to only the mid vowels, the speakers appear to have learned a more general pattern. Um, so I think if uh, simplicity or generality corresponds to uh, naturalness, this could reflect that speakers are biased towards learning a more natural pattern. And uh, although I didn't show the results for um, final consonant alternation, the experimental results, um, I think the results there also reflect potentially a naturalness um, bias. So um, I'm not sure if I have time to talk about that here, but. I mean, there is time for the questions. There, there, are, there is another question in the chat, but if you wanna take a, a couple of minutes to, to elaborate, you're, you're welcome to. Okay, so um, speakers uh, in the ex uh, experimental results for final consonant alternations, seem to have learned, uh, productively learned some alternations, uh, such as uh, alternation of final t, uh, um, and also alternation of final k. But it seems that uh, oftentimes, instead of responding with the expected alternate, given the lexical statistics, speakers uh, responded with deletion of the consonant. So something uh, given a form such as patats, speakers responded with putaan. And uh, I'm so, the results here, I haven't looked had time to look at that carefully yet, but I suspect this could be the result of some sort of substantive bias, maybe, uh, because the final stops in Sadiq are often unreleased and they might be just perceptually more similar to deletion. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, and Nina Caldwell from UCSD has a um, question in the chat. She says, beautiful talk. And she was wondering if you could say more about your thoughts on those overgeneralizations. 
And she was also wondering how you determined if a given speaker knew a given word or form or not. And she okay. apologizes if you explained this and she missed it. No, I didn't. So you are right in asking. Um, so I will address the second question first. So um, I conducted just like a survey, like a survey for each participant before the study. Uh, just to say, see if they knew the um, suffix forms of each um, test item and the items where they knew the suffix forms were just excluded from the analysis. And um, for the overgeneralization thing, uh, so let me see if I should share my slides. I think I can just talk through this. Um, so. Um, speakers overgeneralized the vowel matching pattern specifically, and I think the potential explanation here is the presence of a generality bias. So um, this is something similar to what Albright and Hayes, for example, found in their study of English past tense, where um, rules or constraints or just patterns that have a larger scope uh, tend to be learned better by um, uh, language learners. So in the case of Seedic, uh, the vowel matching pattern potentially affects all non-monosyllabic stems. So in this sense, it has a relatively large scope, and I think this is potentially why it was better learned, um, overlearned, or preferentially learned. Uh, so um, in ongoing work I have right now, actually, I'm trying to model this generality bias in Max Ent, uh, where bias is modeled as a prior probability distribution, and um, the results are pretty promising. Uh, so where implementing a general generality bias does improve um, fit fit uh, model fit to experimental results. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? We have a, a just a few more minutes before the end of the session. If anybody has any more questions for Jennifer. If not, I had one kind of um, big picture thinking question about this. So um, is it possible or have you thought about the idea that um, perhaps these um, generalizations across the lexicon that allow for a particular base uh, to be chosen from among the surface forms, if those arise specifically in order to allow speakers to be able to choose a base, right? And if they have a tendency to be uh, distributed such that the base is always a particular slot in a paradigm rather than, you know, one slot in one case and another slot in another case. Is this, could this be a driver for those kinds of statistical generalizations in the lexicon? Yeah, oh, that's a very interesting question. So I think it could be. Um, and that's a question I want to look at, but would be hard to look at without more extensive historical data, I think. Yeah. So I think in the case of Sadik specifically, historically, the pretonic vowel reduction happened before all the other neutralizing processes. So it, it, I think at some point in the um, history of Sadik phonology, the stem forms were much more informative than the suffix forms as a result of this. So in, in this case specifically, that might have resulted in um, the patterns that we observe, yeah. Right, so presumably there'd be some kind of trade-off between some phonologically conditioned things that cause neutralization in the wrong direction, so to speak, but that's accommodated for by some new statistical generalizations that allow that form to still serve as a base, for instance. Yeah, I think that's the idea. Yeah, cool, thank you. <laughs> okay, unless there are any last uh, quick questions, we're approaching the end of the session. And so I want to thank all three speakers for very interesting talks and thought provoking talks and all the audience for um, being here and asking questions. And um, we'll see you at another session here at the virtual LSA. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you.